John Armstrong from JPL. Uh, John has been the leader of the uh, effort to search for gravitational waves using Doppler tracking of spacecraft for a number of years. He's now also a, a major player in LISA as well. He's going to tell us today about uh, the search for gravitational waves using Doctor tracking of spacecraft in a very, a very low frequency band. So, Thank you, Kip. Okay, so today, as Kip pointed out, and he safely got back to his chair, which is good, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, low frequency uh, experiments using Doppler tracking. And whenever I give uh, these sorts of talks, uh, I feel constrained to put an outline up. So the outline looks sort of like this. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Doppler method, signal and noise transfer functions. I'm, I'm going to not talk much about experiments to date. Uh, because some of that stuff is published and because uh, you can, one can get caught up in, uh, in details. I'm going to then spend a, a fair amount of time talking about the Cassini experiment itself, uh, the most recent experiment, which is also the most sensitive, which uh, data were taken about uh, four or five months ago, and a, a sort of a quick look analysis of those data and what they're going to tell us about the ultimate sensitivity. And then I'm going to conclude really about how one might be able to do better with Doppler tracking and what the ultimate limits of Doppler tracking might be. Um, I have a tendency in these sorts of uh, talks to slip into uh, statements like, like we did this or, or, or we think that, and this is who we are. Uh, John Anderson, Bruno Bertotti, Frank Estabrook, Ron Hellings, Luciano Yes, Massimo Tinto, Hugo Walquist, and really hundreds of uh, engineers and uh, project people at JPL who've really uh, contributed to making this capability possible. The other thing that I uh, do in these things is I lapse into jargon, so I'm going to hear, I apologize in advance, but here's the jargon. Uh, when I say DSN, I mean the Deep Space Network, which is a collection of radio tracking antennas around the world. S-band is a radio frequency of about 2.3 gigahertz. Uh, for example, Galileo has that uh, uh, link. X-band is about 8.4 gigahertz. Mars Observer and Mars Global Surveyor were X-band experiments. Uh, KA band is um, about 32 gigahertz, about a centimeter wavelength. Um, Cassini has that capability. Uh, the fundamental figure of merit here, or the fundamental thing we're trying to get at is Y of T, which is the time series of fractional frequency fluctuations. So delta F over F um, is, uh, is uh, what we're measuring. It has an associated power spectrum, um, S sub Y, and of course, because uh, uh, phase is the integral of frequency, there's an associated phase power spectrum too. To decide whether a uh, uh, a time series or an oscillator is any good or not, uh, you can characterize that through a statistic called Allen variance, which is um, defined here. It's the, it's the structure function of, uh, of locally, uh, uh, this, this is the structure function of a local time average of y of t, and it's related to an integral transform to, uh, to the uh, power spectrum of y or uh, the power spectrum of phase. And a, a major noise source in all of these experiments is scintillation, which is the variation of the phase or amplitude of the wave as it propagates through irregular media between you and the uh, spacecraft, those media being the troposphere, the ionosphere, and the solar wind. Let, let me just make one remark. So you might ask, why don't they just use spectral density of Y? There's, there's no, uh, S sub Y, I think, is in many ways preferred. The trouble is S sub Y is badly behaved at low frequencies. Yeah, that's right. This, 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 this suppresses things at very low frequencies, so you're allowed, even in situations where you have uh, what, what some people might call a non-stationarity in the, in the time series, you can still make meaningful statements about the delta F over F on a given integration time. Uh, as you can see, Ln deviation is a function of, of the time over which you integrated. Uh, I'll give you an exercise about this. Uh, okay. Finally, when I uh, say clock, I really mean a precision frequency standard. Uh, the uplink and the downlink are the, are the radio links from the ground to the spacecraft or from the spacecraft back down to the ground. And DSS stands for Deep Space Station, and it's followed by a, by a number. Uh, for example, DSS-25 is the premier 34-meter uh, beam wave guide in, uh, at Goldstone, California. Uh, let me just uh, briefly mention that the, uh, there are uh, lots of papers. The classic paper is by Frank S. Rook and Hugo Walquist in 1975, uh, further elucidated by Hugo and Massimo. 
and there are also uh, uh, papers that are written on the noise sources. So just as a roadmap uh, of where we stand, you've had lectures, uh, obviously, on uh, various techniques. You're going to have lectures on, on uh, bar techniques. You've had lots of things on LIGO. You'll learn about Lisa, I think. I'm talking about this, where we're doing two test masses. One is the Earth, and one is the uh, spacecraft. So you need two test masses, and uh, one test mass is a spacecraft. This is a picture of a, of a spacecraft with happy people superimposed upon the picture. The, the, uh, the scale here is completely misleading. Uh, he, this is Cassini. Cassini is huge. It's about seven meters tall, but, but it's not, we're not that small. So it's uh, actually a superimposed picture. But the other test mass is the Earth. And glued to the Earth is a transducer. And uh, here is DSS-25 at Goldstone, California. This is, as I said, a beam waveguide antenna. The aperture across here is 34 meters. Um, it's, um, it's in the slow position right now, obviously not tracking. And later on, this little thing here is the advanced media cow system, which I'll show you a picture of, uh, of later. Is it still possible to go out and get tours of the, the facility? I, I, I bet you we could do it. Um, they're, t they're tighter with the rules than they used to be. But I bet you we could do it if you wanted to. There's been interest by other folks too, and 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 if, if I'm a sucker for big antennas, but uh, it, but they are physically impressive. It takes a, thing to it takes a day. Yeah. People want to take a day and do it. We can put together a group. Yeah. No. It, it really, especially the beam uh, as an advertisement for this. This antenna was upgraded for the Cassini experiment, and there's a a, a labyrinth of uh, of equipment there that Massimo Tinto was the system engineer for. And it's uh, uh, it's really quite ingenious. It's things that were done there. It's really neat. Yeah, this, that, that's that's a better way to do it. That, that way, otherwise, it takes really does take sort of four in the morning until until six at night uh, to get out there. So the, the fundamental idea, uh, which is elucidated more carefully by Estabrook and Walquist, is is this. You have uh, the Earth transmitting microwave photons up to the spacecraft and then coherently transponded back down. So that means that the phase is preserved as you go through the transponder on the spacecraft. If uh, there were no noise and, or everything uh, was nice and you plotted the delta nu over nu, delta, which is the change in the, which is the difference between the transmitted frequency and the received frequency as a function of time. If everything were perfect, there were no motion, you would get a flat line. If, however, there were a gravity wave here that was incident on the system, three, three things happen. First, the gravity wave hits the Earth and it shakes it a little bit. And that causes the, uh, the deep space station to move with respect to the incoming photons, and so you get a Doppler shift. So you see an immediate effect here. A little later, the wave is propagated and hits the spacecraft, and you see that effect transponded back to the Earth over here. In a, in a geometry dependent way. It depends on theta, which is the angle between the uh, uh, direction of propagation of the wave and the Earth's spacecraft line. And it also depends on L, which is the one-way light time between the Earth and the spacecraft. And finally, this original perturbation here is transponded one two-way light time later, 2L over C, uh, at the Earth. And so you, you get this characteristic three-pulse response uh, uh, and the reason it has to be described this way is because unlike other detectors, the uh, Earth spacecraft distance is large compared to the wavelength. What is the last one? The last pulse, the last pulse is the it, it, if if the space when this when the pulse hit the Earth, it, it shook the Earth, which means that that the uh, the photons that were being transmitted at that time were, were say red or blue shifted. They go up to the spacecraft. They're coherently transplanted back down to the spacecraft. And then when you compare the, the inbound frequency with your frequency standard you see this pulse echoed one two-way light time later. So these two are always one two-way light time apart. This middle pulse depends upon the direction of the wave came from. The, three, the areas, the sum of the three pulses has to add to zero. And the relative heights depend upon uh, theta. So the fact that they all have to add to zero puts a, a low frequency limit on the system. That is to say, when the pulses begin to overlap, you begin to lose sensitivity. And roughly speaking, at one over the uh, one-way light time, you lose sensitivity. Although that's not not a strict statement. And then similarly, at high frequencies, you have to integrate long enough 
to uh, to get the noise down so that, so that the fuzz here is is smaller than you might want to might want to see the the wave, and so therefore that that sets the high frequency limit. And loosely speaking, that's somewhere between one and one and uh, hundred seconds or so. So the bandpass is sort of between ten to the minus four hertz and ten to the minus one hertz or something like that. And uh, in terms of sensitivity, you're you're probably used to seeing very small numbers, but uh, our numbers are small, but not nearly that small. We're shooting in a Cassini experiment for three times ten to the minus fifteen for burst waves and about uh, uh, 5 or so times 10 to the minus 17 for periodic waves. So in the low, low frequency limit, when these start to overlap, it's very much like LIGO. Exactly. Uh, except the LIGO measures phase, so you do a time integral of the yeah. overlap signal, right. and you've got just the LIGO signal. Right. But, but uh, unlike LIGO, oftentimes we're, the Earth's spacecraft separation is huge compared to the wavelength. I don't know, maybe just the Earth slid past by its or maybe the, the refractive index of the atmosphere changes and that. Very good. Thank you for that view graph. The next, next view graph talks about that. Okay, so so the problem, that's the signal. The, the three pulse is the signal, but there are various disturbances in the length uh, caused by noise. So what are plotted here are four space-time diagrams with space running vertically and time running horizontally, showing the effect of various perturbations in the length as they map to the, the Doppler observable. So for example, the clock, the precision frequency standard is excellent, but it's not perfect. So if it has a little glitch in the, in the, uh, in the clock, as, which is idealized here by this little glitch, then uh, that means that... So you have a clock only on the Earth? That's, that's, that, that is correct. Uh, I should comment that this is a, a non-interferometric non technique. We can't use... Uh, uh, two arms to cancel the uh, phase fluctuations or frequency fluctuations of the clock or the laser in the case of LISA. So it is fundamental that the, um, uh, the frequency and timing system, the clock, be, be good because we can't do any better than that. The coherence is maintained through the clock. And these clocks really are, are, are wonderful. The uh, DSN uh, is state-of-the-art state stuff, but it's, uh, they're not perfect. So if there's a little glitch, it causes the, uh, you to have an apparent Doppler shift right now because you're looking at the, at the difference between the glitched frequency and the frequency that's coming down from the spacecraft. So you see an effect immediately. But that glitch is also transmitted up to the spacecraft and back down. So you see it with the opposite sense one two-way light time later. So the, the transfer function of a clock glitch is an anti-correlated pair of delta functions separated by the two-way light time. So you would convolve the clock time series with this kind of a, of a temporal transfer function, and that would give you what you see in the, in the Doppler observable. Uh, similar, well, uh, plasma is a, is a big problem for previous generation experiments. Uh, the, the Earth's uh, uh, ionosphere and solar wind are dispersive. They're irregular. Um, when, when the wave propagates through, the phase is advanced and retarded. And depending upon where that little plasma blob is, Photons that are going through it, going up and going down, exhibit see the same phase shift. And the, when, the, when the smoke clears, you see you see a pair of positively correlated delta functions, whose spacing would be the two-way light time if it were the ionosphere, or a little less than the two-way light time if it's some if it's something in the solar wind. But the same sense of correlation. If there were an earthquake, then or a micro seismic activity, or more. Uh, unfortunately, more realistically, these, these, these dishes are, these are macroscopic objects, 34 meter antennas, and they, they sag when the, uh, when the elevation changes and they crinkle a little bit and the phase path through the antenna changes. So if you get an antenna mechanical effect, uh, event, that is positively correlated at the two-way light time. Similarly, although not shown on this diagram, but the transfer function for troposphere is exactly the same. And so that from the point of view of transfer functions, you can't tell the difference between an antenna mechanical event or a tropospheric event. And that's part of the reason why we do independent tropospheric monitoring. It turns out that at microwave frequencies, the, um, there's a huge effect due to the dry troposphere, about two meters at vertical, uh, two meter uh, path uh, uh, delay at the vertical. But the dry, dry component of the troposphere is pretty much in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that by making measurements of barometric pressure and then mapping them according to some reasonable mapping function, you can infer with, with reasonable accuracy the path delay um, in the line of sight that your antenna is actually pointing. 
And so that is being reasonably slowly varying and reasonably static is, 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 a, is widely believed to be uh, easily taken out, although it's not as easy as it's widely believed to be true. And the, so, so the net effect is the, um, uh, the next effect is the wet component. There's water vapor in the troposphere. How high is the troposphere? Uh, well, I don't know. Depends on how high you want to go. It's, a, you know, let's say 10 kilometers, something like that. The dry component, is it easily taken out because it has uh, low frequency? Yes. Okay. It's so it's a frequency effect. Yeah, it, 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 although it's not as easily taken out. The, the reason I'm, I'm hedging on this is that the effect, uh, the typical wet component effect, I'll show you some plots, is centimeters or less than a centimeter, and, and the typical dry component effect is two meters. So that means that you have to make, you have, you, all your mappings have to be sort of carefully done so that you don't, ins don't inadvertently screw up your very expensive wet component calibration. I'll, I'll show you some pictures in a minute. If the spacecraft itself buffets, then you're doomed. You can't really tell. It's just if, it, if it's just bouncing around because the fuel is sloshing in the thing, or because they're articulating uh, uh, booms and stuff like that, you're you're doomed. And so you have to ask for a quiet spacecraft. And then, of course, I've this is a diagrammatic way of seeing how the three pulses come come in for a gravity wave. So the spacecraft would be quiet if that gauge is not done often. Well, it turns out that there's there's quiet and there's quiet. We're trying to measure. Um, uh, sort of velocities at, at less than one micron per second, and uh, the, the spacecraft guys. So the face you don't want the face center of the antenna on the spacecraft to be wandering around by uh, average over thir over a thousand seconds. You don't want it to be wandering around by by a micron, and so uh, the fuel in the in the in the in the tanks uh, is not completely damped. It sloshes a little bit, and so the center of mass is moving around a little bit. And, and there are instruments on the spacecraft, we're hitchhikers on the spacecraft, there are instruments on the spacecraft which would like to articulate, which also moves the center of mass. And uh, due to some very clever analysis by the Cassini Attitude and Control System folks, they, they were able to show by measurement that the uh, contribution to the Allen variance, uh, Allen deviation due to the spacecraft motion was of order 2 times 7 minus 16. Uh, on a thousand second integration time. So we're okay with this for Cassini. It's a secondary noise source, but it's a fundamental noise source. So we'd ha if we were going to do something significantly better than Cassini, we would have to, uh, I think, address that. So your spacecraft are not just dry and dead? Uh, no, for example, the Cassini, when it was launched, uh, was about 12,000 pounds, most, uh, much of which was fuel. Um, that brings me to this, this uh, view graph. And that is that uh, um, Alan Lee and his colleagues of the Attitude and Control System were able to demonstrate using uh, actual data that uh, that the contribution to the uh, to the Allen deviation was of order two times ten to minus sixteen, which is much less than their requirements. So that's really very optimistic, very a very um, happy situation. Okay, so I'm going to run quickly through. Discussion of the noise sources. Uh, as I mentioned, the frequency standard noise is fundamental. It has, it has a, uh, a transfer function, which is a positive and negative going delta functions at the, uh, separated by the two-way light time. Measurements by Lute Maliki uh, and company of their uh, very, very ex excellent uh, uh, instruments show at an integration, this is Allen deviation versus integration time log log. So at 1,000 seconds here, uh, they're hitting uh, uh, several times 10 to the minus 16, which is, which is less than, uh, than our requirement. So I just keep it up there. If you go way out to the right, yeah. uh, I'm going to be worrying about, uh, about pulsar timing. And so you're interested in the reading out around uh, a few years. And the best numbers there uh, for signal of Y are like 10 minus 14 on this graph. Well, the pul uh, pulsars are intrinsically good clocks, uh, but they're not, in not great clocks at short times, so. Yeah, but, but the Earth-based clocks that one uses. Right. Are, uh, yeah. And one's concerned about the, the Allen variance on right. them. Right, of course. And out in the region of the periods of 10 years. And uh, these, uh, on here, I thought one could do a little better than 10 minus 14. But uh, it, may, it may be that by ganging these things, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, uh, the interest for Doppler tracking of uh, spacecraft has, has sort of always been down here, so I'm really not an expert at lower frequencies. Yeah. Well, maybe most among us. Yeah. 
down as little tau, uh, with integration time. Half out to times 10 years, well, Maybe to up to 10 to 5, 10 to 6 seconds. That's the thing that they could test it. Massimo was the system engineer for the radio science uh, upgrade for Cassini, and so he's on top of this stuff. Um, anyway, as I was saying, 10 to the minus 15 is more or less what you would need for. Okay. Uh, the other, until recently, plasma simulation noise was the main problem, and that was because uh, the. Uh, Solar wind in the ionosphere are uh, irregular, and their, their density fluctuations uh, uh, scale like uh, wavelength squared. So you win big by going to small uh, wavelengths. Uh, plasma scintillation is, is dominant for S band, but a secondary noise source for the Ka band. And I have, uh, we'll skip over uh, examples of scintillation. But just comment uh, that much of the stuff can be summarized by this one graph, which is a plot of the Allen deviation vertically over here and the Sun-Earth spacecraft angle horizontally. So zero means that the spacecraft is behind the sun. So you're looking at sun. 180 means it's in the anti-solar direction. We like to observe at the 180 point because this, these are measured S-band plasma simulation. If you then take those data and move to X band, they scale to here, and to K band, they scale to here. And going from this graph, which is plasma dominated, to X band, which is a mixture of plasma and troposphere dominated, to Ka band, which is completely troposphere dominated, is uh, is, a, is something that's gone. That's from Galileo to Mars Observer to to Cassini. And so the main problem is to take full advantage of the Ka band uh, plasma suppression. You need to work on the troposphere. And uh, I'll show you a little bit more about that. So um, the tropospheric uh, fluctuations are dominated by the wet component. The transfer function is two delta functions that are separated by the two-way light time. Various independent measurements of the effect have been done using water vapor radiometers by Steve Kime and his colleagues, and there was a very influential set of observations by the late George Resch done at, at the VLA about 15 years ago, which showed that this was all possible to do this. Uh, I will show you Cassini-era data, uh, which will allow us to calibrate out uh, those um, fluctuations. I should just comment that um, there's a notion, I, I showed power spectra earlier, Power spectrum, uh, uh, real, real data sets often uh, are uh, non-stationary. That is to say that the, the statistics of the, of the time series do not, are not time shift invariant, and uh, they can go up and down. And the Earth's troposphere is non-stationary at the, uh, the level goes up and down by a factor of 10. So it's, a, it's, not, it's not quite as clean as one might hope. Here's a, a, a plot of uh, the project manager standing in front of one of the, one of the uh, advanced media cal systems. Uh, here to here is, I think, about at 1.2 meters or so. This is the electronics are up here. These things are in the foreground of that picture of DSS-25 I showed you earlier, and they track uh, in the same direction. So as, as, as DSS-25 tracks across the sky, they track the, uh, the same, same uh, volume of, uh, of air. And observations made. Uh, uh, by George Resch and his colleagues, comparing these water vapor radiometers with a connected element interferometer, which also was sensitive to the phase fluctuations in the atmosphere. It's hard to see on this graph because they're so good, but there are two curves here that map each other very well. And this this gives me, uh, although the, although the path length corrections have not yet been applied to the Cassini data, it gives me high uh, uh, confidence that we're going to do well when that happens. And just to, to, to reiterate the question about two meters vertically, you can see that here to here, you know, it's, this is a centimeter. So it's a, it's a pretty small effect. And you might reasonably ask, uh, if you have two of these things, which one do you use to correct the data? And the, the happy answer is it doesn't matter because the two are very highly correlated. What's plotted here in the upper graph is the square of the so-called squared coherency spectrum as a function of Fourier frequency. The interpretation of this is that it's the square of the correlation coefficient as a function of Fourier frequency between the two WVR time series. So we've got two time series tracking across the sky for, for many hours. And if you 
at high frequencies, you're dominated by the instrumental noise of each one of them, but as you get down into the band that we're interested in, you see sort of 90 or so percent correlation, and uh, so it doesn't matter which one you use. Okay, uh, a uh, potential problem is antenna mechanical noise. Um, these, as I said, these are macroscopic objects, and if you, if, in fact, if you go out to Goldstone sometime, you may initially think that it's impossible to measure velocities at the uh, micron per second using something that's as big as this thing and, 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 uh, and moving across, you know, physical motion of this thing. But in fact, uh, the averaging over the aperture and the, and the precision engineering with, which goes into it actually does make this possible, and differential measurements made by uh, Tom Atoshi and Manuel Franco uh, looking at antenna mechanical noise, place it at about 10 to the minus 15, but that was under a very controlled situation where they were uh, doing a controlled test. Uh, measurements under operational conditions are 100% correlated with tropospheric scintillation um, at X-band, and so they only produce poor upper limits. But we do see large infrequent events um, that are almost certainly antenna mechanical. Here's a plot of a, what's plotted vertically is the uh, an, an intermediate the frequency of an intermediate file. So this is the, the Doppler frequency vertically and time horizontally. These are 10 seconds averages, so they're pretty ratty. But you see this monster event, which is echoed exactly one two-way light time later, which is almost certainly due to, uh, because it's hard to imagine, I mean, it could be troposphere, but it's hard to imagine a little wedge of refractive index that's only 20 seconds wide going over the antenna. So it's almost certainly the subreflector glitching or the antenna going like that, stuff like that. And these are, unfortunately, observed. How large motion would be required to capture that? Uh, that I uh, I don't know offhand. It was uh, it was uh, so it's a, roughly a tenth of a hertz over ten seconds. So uh, ten to the minus three. Well, I have to, if I do it in real time, I'll screw up. But it's a big effect. Uh, you should all, we could also ask the question, what, what about the electronics? Uh, the electronics, it turns out, are perfect almost. This is a controlled test of the, all the other things that I haven't talked about, and they come in uh, at 1,000 seconds at about 2 times 10 to the minus 16. So the electronics are, are really very good indeed. So let me just summarize that um, the signals are three pulses. Um, uh, the three pulse depends upon the direction of the source and it depends on the two-way light time to the spacecraft. It's not shift invariant if the direction or distance depend upon time of observation. And the reason that that's uh, potentially important is that it restricts your use of Fourier transforms, the FFTs, to do some kind of analysis because you can't assume time shift invariance. Um, there's a band pass set by pulse cancellation at the low frequencies and thermal noise at, and clock noise at the high frequencies. And unlike other detectors, the wavelength can be small compared to the size of the apparatus. Uh, real noises are non-stationary, and real experiments have uh, systematic errors. How important is it that you know the waveform ahead of time? It helps a lot. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that just a little bit. I, I won't have to, I, I, there, there, are tech, there, there, are non, there are techniques, that, uh, if you don't know anything about the waveform, and you're just trying to characterize the time series, um, uh, that may be useful. I, uh, they're certainly not so useful for, for Doppler tracking because we're, we're clearly in a situation where we're noise dominated rather than signal dominated. But if you had a situation where you were really just saturated with signals, like maybe Lisa, there may, may be some of these tricks that are, that are non-committal regarding the waveform might be, might be useful. I'll, I'll talk just, I won't talk much about it, but I'll talk a little bit about it. In the picture where you had the three signals, is it important that all the, the, three, the three wave tracks uh, you 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 lose uh, you lose you lose if you're doing a match filter for this thing you you uh, you lose as they, they begin to overlap you don't you don't it's not like it turns off you you degrade gracefully I'll show you a plot but you you uh, it, it's clearly better uh, to have these things isolated. Uh, it's, it's not only better in a very formal sense if you were doing very formal signal processing and doing, you know, setting n, n sigma thresholds and stuff like that. But at some point, um, we have a lot of data, but we don't have so much data that we can't look at it. And a actually, uh, uh, things that give you a, a nice formal 10 sigma hit, when you look at them, you realize, oh, 
the reason that we got a nice form, formal 10 sigma hit is that two of the pulses were there and we had a noise glitch over here. And it's not the sort of thing that you would care to uh, uh, tell your colleagues that you think you've detected something. So having the things, uh, this long answer, the rambling answer to your question, having them isolated is actually pretty good. It's better to have a long two-way light time than a short two-way light time so that you can isolate those things. The bad news about long two-way light times is then you get to be a significant fraction of a day, and all sorts of nasty geophysics start kicking in. You'd, be, you'd have to worry about you know, earth tides and all kinds of stuff. It's just, it's just, it gets ugly when the when the time when the two-way light time gets longer than a, than about five thousand seconds. So anyway, we model the time series like this. It's gravity waves plus noises with various transfer functions. Uh, the gravity wave, the scalar gravity wave in the in the uh, time series is obtained from the tensor gravity waves according to this formula. And the problem is really to exploit the differences in the signal and noises to try to increase, um, to try to make it have a detection. Okay, so observations to date. Um, there's been about, a, I think I counted as about 160 hours or so of data taken prior to the recent Cassini experiment. Uh, Ron Hellings uh, was the first to do a systematic uh, uh, observation for gravity waves uh, using uh, using Doppler tracking. He had a few passes on Voyager looking for bursts. Uh, John Anderson and colleagues were able to show in 1981, uh, based on observations made in 1981, that uh, there were no gravity waves from Jaminga that were, at that time there was a putative excitation of a solar oscillation from Jaminga, and we were able to observationally exclude that. Uh, Frank Esterbrook, Hugo Walquist, and I look for periodic waves. Uh, John Anderson and colleagues looked for chirps. Bruno Bertotti looked uh, for chirps and sine waves. There was an experiment done in um, 1993 between Mars Observer, Gal Galileo, and Ulysses, the only low-frequency coincidence experiment that's ever been done, and maybe the only one that will be done. Um, Frank Esterbrook and colleagues uh, had two long 40-day observation periods which were unfortunately limited by the fact that the Galileo uh, antenna did not open, so that meant that the observations were done on the low gain at S band, and so the sensitivity was more than an order of magnitude less than what it would have been had the antenna opened. Um, and uh, similarly, we have data on Mars Observer. And we took data uh, at the end here in the last 10 minutes. I'll talk a little bit about data taken uh, in Cassini uh, last winter. But uh, rather than talk about uh, results from those experiments, I'm just going to comment that the way that, that I think about this, at least, is that you can uh, imagine you have a phase space of frequency and time. Um, some, some sources sit in this phase space differently than others. For example, a sinusoid is a constant frequency, but it's there for all time. So an appropriate basis function for looking for that might be Fourier transforms, where you isolate, you, you slice it in terms of frequencies along this axis, and you maybe hit this uh, hit this waveform. If you have a burst, though, it might be localized in time, but have a finite uh, bandwidth. So you might want to do that a little differently, either through wavelet transforms or for or through uh, match, match filtering. Uh, linear chirps or or nonlinear chirps go across this. Uh, uh, phase space in different ways. So there's a, this is just one way of thinking about how you might want to process the data to, uh, to isolate certain signals. Um, I don't think I've actually shown you a time series of what, well, I guess I did. But anyway, here's the upper plot here is a, uh, is a plot from Mars Observer, uh, two hours across here. Uh, this is a, not a particularly good day. Um, Two-way light time is here. And these are various uh, uh, representations of the original waveform uh, doing what um, the experts would call subband, uh, there's a word for it, subband sub blocking or something like that. What, basically what you do is you do a wavelet transform and then you block out the uh, higher frequency wavelets and reconstruct the time series. And in this particular case, we're seeing a situation where we see a, a strong autocorrelation at the two-way light time. So most of this stuff up here is, is, uh, is uh, tropospheric and uh, certainly has the wrong signature for gravity waves. If you were to look for sine waves in those data, uh, it would be appropriate to do a Fourier transform in square. In the absence of a signal, the probability density function for the power spectrum is, uh, is exponential, and in the presence of the signal is rice squared. And since each Fourier bin is approximately independent, then the joint PDF for the entire 
uh, data set is just equal to the product of the individual PDFs. And so you can use that to look for um, to look for sine waves. The problem is, and, and of course, if you do that, uh, you can look for sine wave candidates. You, you expect to see exponential statistics. This is a this is a PDF of uh, of sinusoidal candidates from Mars Observer. So logarithm of probability versus amplitude horizontally. So the noise only curve you expect to be a straight line on this curve, and this this fits the data very accurately. Unfortunately. The real situation is a little more complicated, however, because, and we don't do this except for defined candidates. And the reason for that is that, um, that the uh, two way light time changes with time, and the Earth spacecraft direction with respect to the celestial sphere changes with time over the 20 days of the experiment. So you get modulation whether you like it or not. So initial sine wave would look like this a, a, a 10 to the minus 2 hertz sine wave. If it were coming from uh, right ascension of zero hours and declination of minus 69 degrees, would split into something that looks like this. So you, you lose S and R if you just do the naive Fourier transform square and look for sine waves. That's the wrong way to do it. It's not so bad right here at these frequencies, but if you go to higher frequencies, uh, it can even look like this. Uh, you can get uh, terrible uh, line splitting. Uh, this is for the geometry of. Uh, Galileo in 1994 for a source from the galactic center. The, the upper here envelope is the envelope of the sine wave when you pass it through the time-dependent three-pulse response. And you get this terrible splitting. And you can, you can easily lose uh, 10 dB compared to uh, uh, if you do naive Fourier transform of square versus Nash filtering. Um, similarly, you can look, at, look for chirps. And uh, we had, we've had a couple of nice false alarms with chirps, uh, which turned out to, to be associated with ground system. One of the nice things about tracking around the network is that you can observe with different sets of equipment. And so you can then take your time series and decompose it, rejecting, say, all of the data from Canberra or all the data from Madrid, and then reanalyze it and see if it makes, see if you get the same answer. And, uh, in the case, sometimes you don't get the same answer, and, and it turned out to be instrumental effects that was associated with one system, with one ground system only. Um, Bruce match filtering is the right thing to do, I think. Um, but let me just comment about things that uh, that we've tried that might be uh, relevant outside of the Doppler tracking uh, uh, experiments. You can see I prepared a little more than I, than I should have. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about wavelets. That's a time frequency localization procedure, uh, which um, for which there exists. For example, in Bill Press's book, there's a there's a nice treatment about uh, wavelet transforms. To, the thing that, that we've used it for mostly, because we're noise dominated, is to denoise the data, which is to reject the higher frequencies. Uh, while trying to maintain the edges of bursts. And that seems subjectively to, do, to, to be the right thing to have done on Galileo. Uh, so I actually am sort of enthusiastic about wavelets. There's a procedure which the uh, geophysicists call the empirical orthonormal functions. And that is where instead of choosing your basis, set of basis vectors beforehand, for example, sines and cosines for a Fourier transform, you take the autocovariance matrix of the data themselves and look at their eigenvectors. And it turns out that those eigenvectors form a basis for the data. And so in some sense, you're allowing the data themselves to tell you what basis they would like to, to form on. Now, it's been disappointing for us because we have a noise-dominated detector, so all we see is, is the basis vectors of the noise. But if you had a, a completely signal-saturated situation where you didn't have an idea about what the signal should look like, it might be an interesting thing to think about. Um, time series, Doppler time series are pretty, uh, pr pretty well approximated as a Gaussian uh, random process. But um, if you were to look for a non-Gaussian uh, component in the time series, one idea you might want to use is, is bispectral analysis. In spectral analysis, you, you, you look at, uh, you decompose the, the variance, the second moment, into its Fourier bins. In bispectral analysis, you decompose the third moment, the, the skewness. The st the statistically third moment of the of the of the time series into uh, three waves which interact, having the sum of their frequencies be zero. 
The classic reference here is Hasselman, Monk, and McDonald from about 1960. It, this procedure has been periodically rediscovered by astronomers, uh, engineers, uh, uh, geophysicists, space physicists about every 10 years. And so we're about due for another renaissance with, uh, with bispectral analysis. The problem with, with it for us, for Doppler tracking at least, is that it's hard to estimate this well. You, 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 you need to integrate a long time to, to reduce the estimation error statistics of the bispectra to, to points where, you, where they become interesting. And the time series are not stationary over very long time periods. Maybe they're only stationary over a day or a fraction of a day because of the troposphere. And so you, you, you have this conundrum that you can't integrate long enough to, to be interesting because this time series changes its the statistics over that time period. Uh, finally, uh, if you're trying to find a spectral line <coughs> in a time series that has a continuum, there is a very clever technique uh, pioneered by Thompson and colleagues at the Bell Labs called multi-taper spectral analysis. Uh, this is a scheme whereby you don't, uh, uh, I mean the ordinary thing you do, what one might do is just multiply the data set by zero where you don't have any data and one where you have data and that gives you the window function. Uh, which is in this case sine x over x, but you don't have to do it that way. You can use different weights of the data and combine them in such a way as to, to optimally, I think, uh, decompose the data into a smooth continuum in lines. There, there's uh, Thompson uh, and Lanzarotti and colleagues got some notoriety because they claimed that by doing that on KEV electrons observed in the solar wind, that the solar wind is not very turbulent, it's mostly deterministic, and this is, I think, controversial. But the, but the technique is a neat idea, and it gives the same answer in tests with the way the conventional way of doing it down to uh, about uh, seven sigma. When you get down to when you get very close to threshold, then then you get differences between the conventional way and this way. So if you're making very close calls on the data, you might want to use this technique. The bad news is that I'm not aware of any theory of data gaps, and and real real uh, experiments have data gaps, and so you have to deal with that somehow. So I'm going to finish up here with just a little discussion about the Cassini experiment. Cassini was launched um, in 1997. Uh, yeah, I, I, but I'm going to shoot for two because I, otherwise I'll, I'll just geese on. You know, I, my, my wife last night when I was saying that uh, what I was going to talk about, she warned me that I was geezing. So I'm going to I'm going to cut that off because I'm just trying to keep stick with the facts. Uh, this is a, a Titan IV Centaur launch. This was serial number two of this. Um, of this launch vehicle. Serial number one was a DOD launch, which I don't know anything about. But had it failed, Cassini would not have gone probably, would not have gone on, on schedule. The, uh, the spacecraft is heavy. It's about 12,000 pounds, um, uh, including propellant. And so as a consequence, it went on uh, Venus, Venus, Earth, Jupiter, gravity assist. So after launch, it whizzed around the solar system getting gravity assist from Venus and Earth whizzed by Jupiter, and right now we're in transit between Jupiter and Saturn. And this is where uh, we're going to get an opportunity to take three data sets, each 40 days long, uh, one of which was taken last winter. Uh, after the uh, spacecraft was launched, I should comment that, that as all previous experiments, we are um, uh, purely hitchhikers. I mean, these experiments, these, these spacecraft were launched for, for the main benefit of the planetary community, obviously. And we are um, uh, beneficiaries of the capability and along for the ride. This time, though, uh, because of a collaboration between NASA and the Italian Space Agency, we have special purpose hardware on board called the uh, CAT, K A T, K A Man Translator, which allows this spacecraft only to coherently transpond K A band uh, from the ground back to the Earth, thereby getting around the plasma problem. The uh, NASA brought to the table uh, a, a, uh, an investment in the ground system, and uh, the Italians brought uh, the K band translator. Well, the K band translator was not turned on until some time after launch, about two years after launch. And happily, uh, there was much joy in the control room when this signal was observed uh, in 1999, uh, showing uh, that the CAT was working. And then we made a big mistake and we turned it off. That in retrospect, that was a that was a really dumb thing to have done because it introduced problems which caused about eight months of, of uh, debugging. Uh, but that's a story for another time. Not so, a 
Yeah, but we didn't know at the time we switched it off. Go ahead, yeah. We, did, uh, no, we didn't know, but in retrospect, it was uh, dumb. Yeah, we should have. We should have. Yeah, it was a very, it was a, it was a difficult time. It was about eight months there, where it was difficult. But eventually, you know, we, we understood uh, how, how it was there is a there is a model. There is a model for why it behaves the way it does, and it's a, actually the story is almost a sociology story. I mean, it's about big teams and how they how they uh, how they process the same data and what conclusions they reach. But it, anyway, it turned out that it was okay, so it worked out fine. Um, the Cassini experiment was a 40-day track, um, uh, starting November 26, 2001, and ending uh, the 4th of January. As I mentioned, there's new equipment at Goldstone and everywhere. The KA band uplink is new. Uh, the advanced media calibration system is new. New receivers, new frequency and timing system, new aberration correction, new pointing. Uh, and the gravity wave was the, exper was the first beneficiary of this work. Uh, and the, the two things that, that were most important for the gravity waves were the KA band uplink, which knocked the plasma simulation out of the, out of the equation, and the advanced media calibration system. Um, and as I mentioned, the two-way KA band was supported on the spacecraft by ASI, uh, Italian Space Agency supported uh, hardware, the CAT, and by DSS-25 on the, on the ground. There's a discussion of this which is not, not completely up to date, but pretty close in the, on the Kajagua website. I gave a talk there about um, 18 months ago, and it's not, not wildly wrong. Uh, and uh, also there's a, a, a simplified version of this, this lecture on the Kajagua website. We're trying to get to 3 times 10 to the minus 15, which corresponds to uh, velocities of, of, uh, of about uh, a little less than a micron per second, uh, velocity errors. So the data came in, keeping up with them in real time was a bit of a challenge. So instead of trying to do everything at once, uh, my colleagues and I just took two hours per day at DSS-25 that were near meridian transit and analyzed those data to see how things were going. Uh, the high elevation near meridian helps a lot because uh, all of the systematic errors are, are minimized there. So we took the raw data, passed them through a phase lock loop, faked an orbit through it, and then gave us, uh, gave us residuals which would be used to, to study in near real time the statistics of the, of the data. And it turns out that was important because we found problems in the data set and, and we were able, because we were uh, in near real time, to, f to have those problems fixed. So it was an important exercise to do this. So let me just jump to the bottom line, and then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, details. This is a, a plot of data quality uh, based on the quick look as a function of time. So what's plotted horizontally is the, on a logarithmic scale, is the Allen deviation at 1,000 seconds versus time in the experiment, 40 days across here. Uh, before the experiment started, this was uh, the Mars uh, Global Surveyor level. This is, what we're, this is the previous best. This was my guess as to what the troposphere was going to do without correction. And this was my hope about what the KA band system would knock the plasma down to or below that number. So the red dots are the effect of plasma. It turns out there's enough links here. We have an X up, X down, X up, KA coherent with that X up, and we have a K up and K down coherent together. So you, you have enough information there to solve separately for the, for the plasma and for, um, well, you can solve for the plasma on the up and down link and, and figure it out. So that's what you got here. This is the two-way plasma, and the goal was to get it below this line, and it did. The goal of the experiment is where this dot is. The green dots are the two hours worth of data near meridian transit with no corrections applied. So, and the stars are the uh, meridian, uh, or the horizon to horizon um, uh, power Allen deviation from the advanced media cal system. So the one thing to notice is first we're we're well below the previous uh, best already, maybe a factor of four or five, without applying corrections, and that this average thing here was not too wildly wrong because this is what we've actually observed with these stars. The 
it was raining here, so we had some problems. These data are not going to be very high quality. But out of the 40 days, I guess we, we probably hit on 30 that didn't have any obvious problems. So I think it's going to, it's going to largely work. So there are a zillion little anomalies in the data that you can look at, which show uh, neat examples of these transfer functions, which I showed you before. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody afterwards. But, but, there, but there are perhaps details from the point of view of, if you don't, unless you're a Doppler tracker, uh, these are not particularly interesting. Of course.